right. So first off, uh, the media diaries due uh, in a couple of days. It's due on Thursday. Any questions about that? Yeah, Sandra. Um, you were talking in the syllabus. It said that, or on the canvas, it said that you wanted a two pages double spaced. Is that like rigid, like within there? Like if it goes over that? Oh, if you go over, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, that was sort of minimal. So great. Please turn it in through Canvas, right, uh, at the assignment. And if you are wondering how to do that, just let me know. I can show you after, uh, after class. Yeah, so we got a quiz on chapters 1 through 3 on the 14th. Um, so we'll be continuing to take a look at quiz questions before the fact. Next class, we'll do another one of those cahoots. And, uh, yeah, woo. And, uh, and we'll practice on those questions. Olive? Is the actual quiz Kahoot as well? No, I think I'll do it on paper. Okay. Kahoot's a little crazy for a quiz, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just the way I do it. Maybe it's like per paper, yeah. And for those who are streaming, it'll be online as well. So <coughs> do it that way. Um, and then looking ahead, we'll be talking about this today. September 26th is our first term paper. So there are four topics that are um, set there. So we can start talking about <coughs> Uh, at least two of the topics have um, resonance with what we're talking about today. So we'll take a look at the topics. Um, and then also, uh, as we go on with lecture and stuff, we could say maybe, oh, well, this might be an interesting idea for your first term paper. Um, so uh, let's say we'll, we'll, we'll do that on one of the topics today. And next class, we can look at another of the topics. And uh, we'll try to sort of warm up the discussion before you actually have to write. So um, that's probably a good thing to look at right away before we jump in. So that's on the 26th. And uh, let me go to the modules for that. So uh, they're here. There's a special uh, section at the top of the modules for the research papers. So there's the guidelines, which count for both term papers. And then there's the questions. And so if I look at the guidelines here, uh, they should be four to six pages in length, which really means like, you know, minimum four. Um, the same sort of one inch margins, 12 point that we usually ask for. So uh, you're only required to use the ideas from the textbook uh, and whatever other information you need to help you make your points. Um, so uh, if you're citing from the textbook, all you have to do is give, you know, the author name and a page number or something like that. If you're uh, bringing in material that is not in the textbook, I would need full citation uh, so that I can just, you know, verify that. Same, Same thing, thing as fact paper. chain, the research paper, right? So we are so close to turning in the media diary that I'm already hitting you with the research paper because it's only three weeks away. So I want to give you time to, to think about it. So these are, these are the general things about um, research papers. There's not a whole lot. Uh, I can't read pages because I don't have a Mac. So please turn it in with Docker, Docx, or PDF. Richard? Does it have to be in APA format or can it be in MLA too? Uh, it says APA, so let's stick to APA. But it's pretty simple. And I can even give you a link as to where to go with that. I'll hot link that. Um, you're only just doing a bibliographic reference. Research paper number one. Okay. So like I said, there's uh, four topics there. Um, two of them are sort of more pertinent to television, so we'll tackle them next week when we talk about the history of TV. But two of those topics would be suitable <coughs> for writing about radio. So today, let's dig into this one. Discuss the impact that the network system had in developing a national culture. Pertinent areas are advertising, entertainment, and political broadcasting. You may discuss either the early days of radio before television or the early television. <coughs> so this whole idea of what happens when mass electronic communication enters the culture, those changes. And then next class, we could look at this one. Radio remains relatively popular and competitive despite competition from various other media. Discuss the factors that have allowed radio to survive in a telecommunications landscape driven by visual media and the proliferation of mobile devices. Consider radio's response to TV as well as radio's response to internet and mobile media. So 
It is, it, okay, good, Tony, I'm glad. So next class, we'll, we'll come up with some thoughts about that as well. But that one is more about radio the survivor. You know, it's like the first of the electronic media, and yet, you know, if television comes, totally it transforms itself, it's still alive. You know, the internet, mobile come, will it transform itself again? How is it transforming itself? Um, so there's plenty to write in, in that one as well. That said, that's sort of on the table. That's kind of our secondary objective here is to have a few ideas in hand for when you guys go looking to do that. So let's jump into um, the, the history of radio, uh, which is up there in the textbook for us. Okay, so uh, Richard? Uh, is Moore's law important? Moore's, Moore's law important. I mean, it was important to the previous chapter where we talked about the increasing pace of innovation in a digital <coughs> culture. So that's important. Uh, on to, to concepts for today, though. Did that answer your question? Yeah? Okay. Because uh, it's easy to look up what Moore's law is as well. And, you know, it's a real kind of popular notion. All right. Talking about electronic media, we're not going to spend a lot of time on what we defined as point to point electrical communication, which Remember, that's where one individual sends a message to another. Uh, it is pertinent because it formed the basis of uh, the, uh, uh, the early cultures, the early radio cultures understanding of what radio was, in the sense that they talked about radio telegraphy. Why telegraphy? Well, because they understood communication at that point through the telegraph, right? Uh, so that was the big revolutionary uh, medium, electronic medium of the 1870s, invented by Morse and the Morse code. Dee, 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 was the way that they were coding messages to go through there. And we did mention how that, as an electronic medium, um, created a much more interconnected culture. Uh, you know, I gave an example from business where you could start finding out, you know, prices for goods in another city and then thereby buying in another city, bringing to your city, selling, and those kinds of information, you know, uh, exchanges were pretty important back then. Uh, and then, of course, the telephone brought voice into this, which was uh, also a great advance. People didn't have to code things. So that opened up, uh, you know, this form of communication. You didn't have to go to someone who knew Morse code to have your message tapped in and stuff. You could actually talk over the phone. So that was a big deal, but it all remained point to point electrical communication, you know. Uh, so there was uh, also, given that, um, a sense that, wow, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to string expensive wires across the country, especially in ship-to-shore communication, uh, you know, with sort of heartbreaking uh, events like ships sinking and stuff like that, or even, even a boat's coming into harbor, what exactly has it got on it so we can warn everybody or start, you know, get the orders in to start selling stuff. A lot of reasons both for business and for you know, safety that uh, ship to shore communication would have been really, really interesting for us. So there are some ideas out there uh, at that time about uh, wireless, the possibility of wireless transmission. Um, so uh, what we know of as radio uh, is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the earth is encased as we're surrounded by electromagnetic energy. Uh, at certain frequencies, we call those radio frequencies. Uh, and uh, it was theorized by James Maxwell uh, 150 years earlier that there was uh, an electromagnetic uh, uh, field around us and that um, uh, it, it should it, we should be able to intervene in it. But the person who actually demonstrated this was Heinrich Hertz. Um, and those taking the audio classes know that we uh, uh, abbreviate uh, frequency with HZ, which is in honor of Heinrich Hertz. Um, so he demonstrated uh, that, um, that, that uh, the electromagnetic spectrum existed in a very interesting way. Uh, he set up about 20 feet apart, uh, two, two, uh, two, two um, 
conductive sort of tuning forks, if you want, a little bigger than that. And in one side of the room, he shot a whole lot of electricity through it so that a spark jumped across the gap between the little, oh, I'm not going to draw this up there. Imagine two tuning forks, a spark, he put a lot of energy in here and a spark jumped across the two tines of the tuning fork, if you want, right? And ever so slightly, this was all done in a darkened room, you could see at the other tuning fork a spark jump as well. So by creating a disturbance in the electromagnetic uh, surrounding over here, uh, there was a, a, a corresponding jump over there. And that was really exciting. It kind of demonstrated that you could charge, change, change something in the electromagnetic area, uh, what you would call it, uh, and it would happen over here. <laughs> Usually I use a film to demonstrate this, but I'm trying to run to another film. So uh, uh, that was Hertz's experiment, which, which proved that you, know, you could create a disturbance in one place and it would show up in another. So the idea is, gets into Guglielmo Marconi's head, an Italian inventor, um, sort of a, a, a rich kid with time on his hands, starts thinking, well, what could we do with this? And the idea is, well, you could turn this into a form of communication. If you used Morse code and you created sparks going dip, 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 you could start sending coded messages through the radio waves. And that was, that was Marconi's uh, big, big sort of brainstorm. And first he, sold it, first he sold it to the English as a ship to shore form of communication. And he was, he was uh, perfecting this all along. And then uh, he brought it to the United States with great fanfare. Uh, at that point, he'd made a lot of money already uh, licensing it in England. And he sailed a yacht up and down the Hudson River at New York and demonstrated his, uh, his invention. Uh, with you know great fanfare, Richard, question. So, if Hertz Hertz had didn't use uh, tuning forks, he, he said that he used tuning forks, right? They were not audio tuning forks. They were just metal metal objects with a gap between. Well, just random metal objects. Uh, you can take a look if you want. Yeah. I was just my curiosity was that was it tuning forks or was it something specific or was it something. Well, the, the gap was specifically engineered to, um, to, have the, to have the right gap, the right gap size so that there could be a, a spark jumping. This was connected to these metal plates with another spark gap in the middle, and uh, this acted as a sort of aerial. This was Hertz's receiver. It's there simply a loop of copper wire. Well, the big spark uh, creates radio waves with enough energy to make a tiny spark jump across the gap between these balls in the receiver when they're held very close together. So, um, if I hold these in position. OK, Bill. If you look carefully, you can just see the spark jumping across the gap. These sparks are so tiny that Hertz had to let his eyes get accustomed to the dark for 15 minutes and then watch the sparks through a magnifying glass. His apparatus only had a range of a few meters and he had no interest in finding any practical uses for it. The first person to use radio waves for signalling was Giuliano Marconi. Marconi had been a difficult child. His mother was a Jameson from the Irish whisky distillers who'd run away to Italy to be an opera singer and married an Italian landowner. She quickly got bored on his estate. There's not much going on here. I think we'll go for a little jaunt. The infant Marconi spent much of his childhood being dragged round Europe by his mother. Where are we going, Mama? Barcelona, or perhaps Boulogne. These are cute, but uh, <laughs> let's see what his device looked like if we move on over here. Sell his ideas.
This is what Marconi had. This is Marconi's original equipment that he brought to England with him. This is his transmitter with an induction coil like Hertz's and these balls that concentrated the energy of the spark. One end would have been connected to the aerial. This is his receiver. The aerial went on here. This is his coherer inside the glass tube. The filings are actually in the gap in the middle. And this is the device to tap it. Marconi would have been sending a, a combination of long pulses and short pulses, uh, sending messages in Morse code. Well, this original apparatus only had a range of about three miles, but Marconi gradually increased the sensitivity of his coherers and the size of his transmitters till he was sending messages hundreds of miles. The larger transmitters had much larger spark gaps, which got very noisy, so he had to take to putting them in enclosed boxes. Marconi's early systems had a big disadvantage. They couldn't be tuned. You can hear the signal from our spark transmitter all across the short, medium and long wave bands. The reason is that sparks create chaotic waves of all sorts of different wavelengths. What was needed was a more precise transmitter than a spark. This was the solution, the tuned circuit. It suddenly all starts to look like a proper radio, but the basic parts are still quite simple. There's a coil of wire here called an inductor and a series of overlapping metal plates here called a capacitor. The electricity whizzes backwards and forwards from one to the other, oscillating thousands of times a second. The valve acts as a sort of pump, keeping the whole thing going. You can see a picture of the radio waves this tuned circuit's transmitting on this oscilloscope that I've hooked up to a short aerial. If I hold it near the tuned circuit and switch on, you can see how regular the oscillations or waves that uh, it's transmitting are. Now, if I compare this uh, with the spark machine, you can see just how chaotic its radio waves are. Once the tuned transmitter had been perfected, spark transmitters were quickly banned for polluting the airwaves. With the problem of interference solved, radio seemed so miraculous that it could be capable of almost anything. Early radios did still have one limitation, they couldn't transmit speech, only the simple pulses of Morse code. Morse code still used for messages on the shortwave band, and pulse codes are also... All right. So that's a lot better to see what he was actually using rather than just to hear my uh, description of it, I guess. Um, so you can see that uh, um, although Marconi... Uh, you know, Marconi gets the brainwave. We can use this for communication. Uh, he gets a tuned circuit going so that um, one can actually transmit on a particular frequency. I don't know if that was clear from their demo, but the early problem was that if you had three people transmitting within 10 miles of each other uh, and they weren't on specific frequencies, uh, you know, then it would just be kind of cacophony. Nobody Nobody could distinguish what message was for whom. So getting things onto uh, a, uh, a, a tuned frequency that you could go to 970 or 990 or something like that in the AM band anyway, if we were using today's kinds of examples, um, that allows them to distinguish between kind of one program and another. But uh, we're still talking Morse code until Reginald Fessenden uh, manages to um, uh, get voice and music over there. So again, th all these, all these, uh, these early inventors or entrepreneurs are, they're always publicizing themselves. So Fessenden uh, um, plays, plays the violin and reads the Bible on, I think it was New Year's Eve or something, <laughs> and just blows away everyone who's used to hearing like dee 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 Morse code. Uh, now you're hearing voice and music over there. So um, we're in the early 1900s now with all of this. And uh, um, 
you're, you're starting to get amateur radio operators, people, people who are interested in the whole technology uh, with those little crystal radio sets that you can still get now, actually. So, uh, you know, a, a crystal can be used as a receiver. It'll produce a very, very low level output. Um, so those kind of crystal <coughs> sets, I mean, they were cheap. Um, if you had a, a piece of gallium and you could attach uh, wires to it, you could eventually hear, um, you know, audio through a little earpiece, but uh, it wasn't um, something that could be amplified. It was really weak. Uh, so some of the great inventions came after that that were necessary for um, uh, turning this into, uh, you know, an easy to use, easy to share type of medium that could really catch on. And Lee DeForest is uh, the first sort of American, big, big deal American inventor who gets into this with what he called the Audion Tube. So um, the Audion Tube is, well, we don't need to go here yet. The Audion Tube is, a, is like, a, if, if any of you have a, an electric instrument or an, uh, like if you have a tube amplifier, either for hi-fi or for uh, um, uh, electric guitars or something like that, you basically have the vacuum tube, which was, they even had a, a model, of, a little later model here, where the vacuum tube was kind of used to store, to store the electrical current um, that was running that radio that he was using. Well, uh, DeForest, uh, came up with a, a vacuum tube slightly modified which actually worked as a receiver itself so it had had the main components in it uh, and that was a, a sort of a revolution he called the Audion tube and he got it just by kind of tinkering around with existing vacuum tubes which were like for amplification so by adding an extra component in there uh, he was able to turn it into something useful for radio but he never quite understood uh, how it worked. Um, many people point to uh, another inventor who had a whole history with him, uh, which is not even in the slides, that's a shame, uh, named um, Edwin Howard Armstrong. Uh, he actually figured out why the Audion tube worked and introduced a couple of more um, really important developments on it, which both, uh, what he did what he called uh, a regenerative circuit, which made the Audion tube much more receptive, much louder. And uh, then there was, uh, at that point, a problem with keeping your radio set tuned to the right frequency. So like you would tune into like 990, and it would slowly kind of drift off, so you'd have to tune back. and. Uh, so that wasn't very convenient. So you couldn't go to the kitchen while listening to whatever. I mean, you could, but it would start to slowly drift off, and then you'd have to, to kind of crank it, crank it back over. Yeah. So uh, there's a great documentary. It details the incredible conflict between DeForest Armstrong and uh, the head of NBC RCA, whose name was David Sarnoff. Here's Armstrong. Him aloof, sarcastic, altogether too willing to question basic assumptions in front of his fellow students. But Michael Pupin, a pioneer in the new science of electromagnetic waves, saw in Armstrong a kindred spirit and encouraged his experiments. Armstrong set out to discover precisely how the DeForest Audion tube worked something its inventor had never really understood, so that he could increase its power to amplify. In the middle of the night, on September 22nd, 1912, he succeeded. It was his first great discovery. He woke up his younger sister, Ethel, and forced her to listen to the deafening sounds pouring through his headphones. Suddenly the door to my mother's room was thrown open and Uncle Howard burst into the room, waking my mother up. And he was dancing round and round the room with this box and he was saying, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. Great amplification obtained at once, Armstrong noted in an account of his elegant invention. It was a simple idea. He called it regeneration.
Armstrong's circuit fed the signal that came from a radio tube back through it again and again, each time increasing its power. He found he could do this as many as 20,000 times a second. Regeneration was the single most important advance in the history of radio. He patented his audion receiving system in 1913. While Lee DeForest was trying to stay out of jail, Armstrong had put his audion to work. And he made another discovery. When the feedback was increased beyond a critical level, the tube oscillated, creating its own radio waves. Armstrong had made it possible for DeForest tube to transmit as well as receive. And it was now perfectly suited for voice and music as well as code. All of a sudden, everybody could hear these signals very, very much more easily and at much greater distances. And of course, that brought the explosion of broadcasting. On the last night of January, 1914, in a wireless shack near Belmar, New Jersey, Armstrong demonstrated his receiver for the chief inspector of the Marconi Wireless Company. Signals from Ireland and Hawaii, San Francisco and Nova Scotia all came through loud and clear. The chief inspector pronounced it the most remarkable receiving system in existence and recommended that the young inventor's discovery be licensed to his company. The inspector's name was David Sarnoff. Telegraphy showed the general the way. That is Jason Robarts. Yeah, an old actor. Um, so DeForest was uh, in jail. He was always, he wasn't a great businessman. So I'm not sure exactly why he was like having troubles at that point. But uh, he was, he always had like, he went bankrupt so many times. Yeah. But he was just an amazingly prolific kind of tinkerer type of guy. But Armstrong is widely respected as the you know the the genius behind a lot of a lot of the big inventions in radio, including single-handedly FM radio. Uh, whereas AM radio, which is what we're talking about, amplitude modulation, it's one technique of making radio, was you know the the, the result of Marconi uh, and uh, um, uh, De Forest. Armstrong and Tesla's way back there in the beginning as well. Actually, Tesla more more in the era of Marconi, uh, just in terms of, of trying to use make some use of the electromagnetic spectrum and the spark gap operations. So so if you look at AM radio, it's a bunch of people who contribute to it. Uh, FM was Armstrong's baby, all all by himself. Uh, came out of a kind of a real bitter experience that he was having with, um, with, uh, with, with proving his genius and getting, getting credit for his invention. Because while he got a patent for uh, his modification of the Audion tube, DeForest sued back. And there was a 20-year legal war as to who could claim credit and you know, the money for uh, the you know, uh, re regeneration, which, as you saw, was built on DeForest's Audion tube. Uh, so they, uh, Armstrong and DeForest, were constantly at it. And although Armstrong got an initial patent, it was eventually overturned. And then DeForest got credit for it. Then they had an appeal on that. And DeForest was on the stand for three hours trying to explain how his Audion tube actually worked. And he couldn't. He couldn't coherently explain how. Whereas Armstrong could. So, you know, and it bounced back and forth. And Armstrong eventually uh, did not get credit for it, although he uh, went on to uh, invent in the Second World War this heterodyne circuit. Uh, which solved the tuning problems, which also made him a millionaire just based on that. Uh, and he had a huge amount of stock in the RCA Corporation, which grew out of Marconi. When Marconi came to the United States, uh, he set up his own company to make radio, as he had in England. And uh, he hired the young David Sarnoff, who you saw in that picture there, who was a Russian immigrant, like literally a guy who came with nothing. 
uh, selling newspapers on the street, but hustled his way into the radio business, which in the early days they still thought would be like telegraphy, sending messages back and forth. So Sarnoff goes to work for Marconi. Uh, Marconi founds the American Marconi Company, and it's only in the First World War uh, where um, Congress, Congress makes a law that you can't have a communications uh, company uh, owned by foreigners because of the whole, you know, paranoia about, uh, well, paranoia, I don't know whether it was paranoia, it was, but the whole concern about basically foreign, foreign ownership of communications within the USA, especially during wartime. Uh, so uh, American Marconi became RCA. Everyone's heard of RCA, right? Yes. And so RCA was one of the big early radio companies. And uh, initially, you know, the radio business is all about selling radio sets. But soon they realized, well, you know, we're going to sell this to a bunch of people, but we've got to have some programming on here. What are we going to do? And uh, so that becomes another, another issue that uh, has to be worked through. So um, it, in order to get radio off the ground, uh, Congress realizes that uh, there have to be some kind of basic frameworks in order for, uh, uh, you know, uh, a licensing process so that just not anybody can open up a radio station and next week down the block someone else opens up a radio station on the same frequency and your original investment is destroyed and, uh, you know, so that kind of thing needs, needs working out. Um, so Congress moves immediately to... Um, uh, to, to define radio waves as part of, you know, uh, national public property, just like it was actually, you know, land or something like that. So uh, the airwaves belong to the people. It's a scarce resource, and therefore they have the, um, you know, the mandate to, to uh, legislate, to create rules for it. It's not like they're messing around with private business. The airwaves are public stuff. And part of, part of what pushes this along as well is the sinking of the Titanic, uh, where as, as soon as radio comes out as a ship to shore medium, uh, all, all the shipping companies use it. But uh, they didn't have very strong regulations as to how they should use it. So when this Titanic sinks, it sinks and there's only one ship with a, within distance with an active awake radio operator who can get the distress call. So, uh, you know, based on the, you know, huge loss of life, over a thousand people, um, there was a kind of a public pressure or wish, to like, okay, let's, let's get radio ironed out. Let's, you know, let's use this for, for what it can do, you know. So the early Radio Act of 1912 is voted in by Congress, which uh, establishes frequencies and a rudimentary licensing um, uh, arrangement so that people can start you know, getting a license to, to broadcast. <coughs> At this point, we're still thinking point to point, right? Uh, in World War I, uh, the, the government took over all the patents that were privately held, um, and uh, thereby did everybody a favor because, as you could see with DeForest and Armstrong, uh, there was that was one sort of patent war being waged. But there were a lot of patent wars going on at that time, with various, you know, bits of the radio technology package resting in the hands of different companies, different individuals, uh, and that was slowing down progress. So World War I gives the opportunity to consolidate all of that and come out at the end of it with a much stronger, um, uh, you know, s shared sense of, um, of, of uh, sh shared technology, basically. And a lot of it, the, there were a lot of radio operators were actually trained during the First World War II. So they were able to uh, uh, bring that knowledge back with them and set themselves up as engineers in the burgeoning, you know, local radio industry. So that's what was going on. Um, there were a number of big companies that were involved in radio, as we're talking about the, the 19 teens into the 1920s. Westinghouse, which was, you know, 
a light bulb and electronics manufacturer already. They got involved. AT&T, the phone company, they were involved. And RCA, which was the, you know, the Americanized uh, development off of Marconi's company. They, they kind of, they all sat down and they split up the business so that Westinghouse would do the sets, the radio sets. Uh, AT&T would actually have the monopoly over sending the messages because again, this was point to point. It was sort of like telephone and stuff. Uh, and RCA would uh, get into um, manufactured sales as well, I guess. But they would very soon move into content creation. So there's an explosion of radio sets being sold, right? And radio stations on the air. Uh, so check it out. A lot of early radio stations were viewed as kind of, th this was going to be a, uh, a promotional add-on to, uh, to an existing business. So they were, you know, thinking, well, we could, you know, sort of use this as maybe for putting out information. So for, um, you know, kind of uh, promotional means of, of radio at that point. But the big question is, okay, how are you going to make money at this? How, how can we do this? And um, they came up with what they called toll broadcasting. So toll probably makes you think of telecommunications, like telephones and stuff, right? So that was the idea that to send a message, you had to pay some money. And so this is the early idea of advertising over the radio. It's like they thought, well, you can go into an AT&T office, and you can pay your toll, and we will broadcast this message uh, for you. you know? And that obviously was going to be used by um, uh, companies that wanted to advertise more than individuals who were interested just in a kind of a point-to-point -point message that they would send. Um, now we've got a very important thing, especially for our prompt for our question, which is the creation of networks. Um, so they called this chain broadcasting at that time. And there was the idea that uh, you could um, maximize the value of your content if you could connect different radio stations in different markets together. So that was the idea that led to networks, basically. Uh, if you could get together a dozen stations in different cities, you could use the same content on each one of those stations. So there was a big Jack Dempsey fight in the 20s, which again had people really interested. And that was one of the high-profile chain broadcasting events. You know, this, this live broadcast of a fight, a uh, professional fight. And uh, that kind of demonstrates also how AT&T was involved because the way they linked those stations together was through long-distance telephones. So, you'd, you know, wherever, if you, were, if you were broadcasting in this fight out of New York, AT&T would link up all the stations in different, in different cities by long distance telephone lines. And chain broadcasting initially was sort of a bunch of one-offs. You could pull together you know, a dozen stations or, or more for, for the event. But in your day-to-day -day programming, you wouldn't be doing chain broadcasting. It remained local. But pretty soon, they realized that uh, you know, getting, getting the, the a cappella group from down at the corner to come in and sing on the air was okay a few times, but eventually uh, your audience would get tired of it and it was just unsustainable to come up with local content all the time. So um, chain broadcasting looks to be able to solve that problem by centralizing your content creation in a city like New York, which already has a huge entertainment business full of, you know, the very best entertainers in the country, you can hire them to go on the radio and you can chain broadcast that out uh, to different stations all over the country, basically. So this was another, another piece of the puzzle coming together as to how you could, um, how you could make enough money and get enough content to fill up all these broadcast hours all over the country. You know, you can sell advertising and you can link stations together and use your content 
across all of those stations. Sort of an economy of, a mass economy if you want, you know. Make one program, but put it on 20 stations, 40 stations, stuff like that. So uh, um, at the same time, they're working on uh, how do you pay the performers and stuff. And so the way it worked out originally was that the, uh, the performers and songwriters collected royalties for uh, radio playing their compositions on the, on the air. Uh, however, they were not compensated for the actual performance. So, and that continues to this day. Um, Congress set up, as you see early on, ASCAP was the first of these uh, uh, associations that were created in order to collect royalties for songwriters, composers, when their stuff gets played on the air. Um, there's other ones called um, CISO, and there's another one too. ASCAP. Sorry, I'm blanking on what they are. Anyway, they're there to collect the royalties for the artist, but performers uh, don't get paid through ASCAP. So the whole argument of the radio industry was when they started playing the records, they would say, well, you know, this is promoting your career. So your performance is not going to be uh, 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 something that we have to license. It will pay you to be on the air, you know, for your appearance. But we don't have to license that. It's just your, it's the songwriting and the compos comp composers that make the money out of radio. So that still goes on in terrestrial radio now, which is cool. So now they come, uh, this idea of chain broadcasting makes a lot of sense. And um, the, the uh, uh, RCA company creates the national broadcasting company in order to supply content to uh, their stations. And RCA owned some stations, but they also got into what we call affiliation, which you probably all heard, right? So uh, privately owned independent stations can affiliate with a network, carry the network content, uh, and split advertising revenue with, with the network as well. And so that's, that's an arrangement that, that works out. Um, NBC in 1926, followed by the United Independent Broadcasters. So you can see just in the name, what they were was a bunch of stations that look at NBC and said, whoa, well, I mean, that makes sense to be a network, right? Let's get ourselves together as a network. But they didn't have the enormous capital that RCA did, which they were making so much money from selling radio sets and stuff that they, uh, they, they could fund a pretty robust network. So UIB faltered a little bit until it was bought by William Paley, uh, who was a rich guy from a, from a family that made its money in cigars. Uh, but Paley creates the CBS network, Columbia Broadcasting System, uh, because one of, one of the companies that was brought in along with UIB was the Columbia record label. So there's already a pretty tight connection between uh, music and radio at the same time too. So uh, at, at that point in 27, you basically have two competing networks going and they'll be going for forever. <laughs> they're still there. <laughs> eventually, they're, eventually they're joined by others, but uh, those were the two big ones. Um, and, and quickly the local independent stations affiliate with the networks because it's such a powerful proposition. You've got this incredible content coming out of major centers. Uh, and it just makes a, makes a big, a lot of sense. Meanwhile, Congress gets in and creates the, uh, the precursor to today's Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. The FRC in 1927 created. So they officially issue licenses. Uh, they also changed again the, uh, the frequency distributions for radio. Um, and they, they make sure that in each local area uh, that there will be no interference from the signal of one station on one, on one uh, frequency to another. So that's some of their important business. And also this idea that because the airwaves are a public good, stations must operate in the public interest. And so ever since then, uh, broadcasters over the 
terrestrial airwaves or radio or television have to demonstrate that they're doing something in the public interest, even if it's, um, you know, even if we're not talking a PBS or NPR station, they are still, you know, uh, eager to demonstrate that they're doing some kind of public good just based on, on all of that. Cool. Uh, so uh, that regulatory thing is extended in 34 and the FCC takes over both that and also uh, tele telecommunications. So it's kind of a restructuring at the government uh, level. Um, they get more involved in content and making sure, for instance, that, um, uh, I mean, an early issue that they tackled is uh, um, the, use of pol uh, the use of radio in politics. You know, uh, they would send letters to stations where the public had complained, you know, well, man, this station is just disseminating lies. And uh, so they would, they would, uh, um, uh, sort of, they only closed down a couple of stations based on content problems, but uh, they did, they did um, intervene in content, especially where it was uh, related to politics. So from there came the idea that um, you had to give equal time to, um, you know, official candidates in, in politics, that if you had a conservative, you also had to give equal time to, uh, you know, the other side of the aisle, if you want. And, and they would um, um, actually, they were not mandated to provide this for free, but they had to make sure that the prices were the same to, for political advertising as well. So if, if you were selling some spots to, you know, the Republicans, you also had to, you know, pledge to sell the same amount of spots at the same price to Democrats if they wanted to buy them. So that was uh, an early thing that led to um, the Communications Fairness Act later on. Um, there were additional networks that came and went. We'll see that in television as well. Um, yeah, okay. So let's try to spend, you know, some time thinking about what goes on in the culture here. Um, because what you have now, uh, by the early 1930s, you have radio as a truly mass electronic medium, uh, which is broadcasting entertainment, information, politics, out to the rest of the country from one sort of centralized location. Um, and this, you could see this at the same time as the culture is also uh, responding to motion pictures. And, you know, Hollywood's uh, ability to, again, take the images of a very few people, stars, and spread them across the country, you know, in, in a, another kind of very powerful but visual medium, the movies. So you have both of these coming up around the same time, you know, uh, and uh, with, some, with some big changes. Um, in terms of information, the newspapers were very worried about being uh, scooped because newspapers had to publish on a, you know, twice daily schedule, whereas radio was immediate. So that's, you know, it's a, it's a synchronous medium and it's, it's a powerful one. So uh, the newspapers and the, especially the wire services, which were the, um, you know, the, uh, the cooperative news gathering and distribution companies that were set up by all the local newspapers. So the wire services were sort of the networks of newspapers, if you want. They were very hostile to radio. They were afraid that radio would, uh, you know, take the business away from the daily newspapers. So they came to an agreement where um, radio was not to uh, was was not to broadcast breaking news. Uh, it was supposed to um, hold news until after publication times for newspapers and such, to give newspapers a chance to sort of sell their information first. And that was the Biltmore Agreement, um, but it pretty quickly fell apart as you know. Um, there was really nobody to police this agreement. It's not like the government had people listening in and uh, uh, you know, saying, well, you did some breaking news today. That's bad. We'll fine you. It wasn't like that at all. 
So that was a cooperative agreement that, um, that fell apart. But nonetheless, you had the, the wire services, which supplied the national news to most of the local newspapers, would not deal with radio for a long time. So radio actually set up its own. So you're seeing, you're seeing uh, in, this, uh, you know, in this culture uh, a lot of old media competing against the, the new medium, worried about how it could take away from uh, an established business like the newspaper business. Uh, but you also have um, masses of, uh, uh, of um, uh, you know, music. Is, is, radio is an incredible conduit for popular music. Um, so think about, you know, the reputation of the early, late 1920s. I mean, late 1920s, early 1930s, basically. A real kind of, uh, they called them the Roaring Twenties. Uh, a real kind of uh, uh, um, uh, party, party vibe until, until the Great Depression, let's put it that way. Um, and, and so, again, if you think about the structure, I'm, I'm thinking about how one could, you know, like developing on this for a term paper, if you think about entertainment becoming centralized and spread throughout the country, where, you know, primarily you'd, you'd have um, nationally known entertainers now who could get on the radio and be heard by millions of people at once, you know, versus even just a decade or two earlier, their, their contact would have been, you know, per performers, it would have been, you know, tours, touring from one city to another, doing big concert halls. Now they can sit in New York and reach everybody over the radio. Uh, the music business itself, you know, um, popular songs, you might hear somebody sing it when they come through on a tour. But after that, you were buying sheet music, you know, and you were learning how to play it in your, in your living room, right? Uh, so um, recorded music starts to get popular around the time of radio. But radio sounds much better than, you know, putting a little, you know, wax thing, putting a, putting a, putting a record on at your place. So uh, radio has better quality. Uh, it's free once you buy the set. I mean, that's another thing, right? It may, it may have cost a month's salary first to get one of these radio sets. But after that, it's all going to be free. Uh, and so on and so forth. So you have, again, these businesses all coming up together, but creating a kind of a mass popular culture that really we had no, no precedent for before. Simultaneous distribution of information, entertainment across the country, you know, uh, and you have all these businesses that are, that are responding to that, like the newspapers. But, uh, but great opportunity, you know, and great changes in the culture. Celebrities now, like the way that we know celebrities today, is starting there with the movie stars and the radio stars, you know, the crooners who are on the air and stuff. And, uh, and, and, and you're, you're getting like a national profile of these people. And uh, in terms of politics, because that's also part of the... Oh, Richard, did you want to say something? I mean, it's not a big deal. I, I kind of feel like what happened in the early 90s and 1900s, uh, what radio, de radio did around that time, is what the internet is doing right now. Kind of feel something like that. Keep going. Do you think it's like possible that you know, what radio you know, did to possible newspapers and all those things, the internet is doing the same thing to... Oh, I'm pretty sure, yeah, you know, as in, and uh, you're seeing all the other media respond to this new possibility of distribution, yeah. This opens to a new volume, which we, I don't think anybody will alive at that point, but so this points towards, as you, you know, as history states that, you know, radio was big, but now that, you know, radio is not there, so it means that internet, somewhere down the line, might be obsolete as well. Depending on what comes next, yeah, yeah. You know, again, I don't know if things become totally obsolete for a while. They, they usually continue on. You know, newspapers did fine, actually, even after radio took a lot of their breaking news opportunities <coughs> away from them. The newspapers, you know, kind of shifted over to providing a little bit more of a longer view, a more reflection, 
uh, going places that, that radio couldn't necessarily go. You know, versus radio got the immediate stories. And they used to do like these man on the street things where they'd, they'd lower a microphone out of, out of the window of the radio station and they'd have a reporter on the street just asking people, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know, and so they, they, you know, they pioneered that type of, you know, news gathering or opinion, opinion driven journalism and newspapers kind of went another way, you know. Um, and then in, in terms of politics, this is the period, uh, right, the early 30s, right, we get into the Great Depression and the whole um, uh, collapse of the economy. And Roosevelt is the first radio president to actually make use of the medium to, you know, try to speak above the heads of the, you know, news industry, let's see, directly to the people. So again, it's a similar type of thing, whereas a politician like Roosevelt would have toured the country and done speeches off the back of trains or in, you know, big, 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 uh, big, um, well, you know, uh, sports arenas and stuff like that. When he can get radio, he, he changes. And if you even listen to his tone, although, I mean, they tone it down a little bit. He still sounds like he's orating out to a crowd. But, uh, but you'll hear. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. I owe this in particular because of the fortitude and the good temper which everybody has, with which everybody has accepted the inconvenience and the hardships of the banking holiday. And I know that when you understand what we in Washington have been about, I shall continue to have your cooperation as fully as I have had your sympathy and your help during the past week. So, I mean, you know, the situation was there was a run on banks. Everyone was taking their money out of the banks because of the uh, collapsing economy. And the banks didn't have enough money to hand out anymore, so they closed all the banks, which they called the banking holiday. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, but, but what you're getting here is the President of the United States talking, you know, quite personably to people on the radio, saying, well, we need to explain this to you, you know, just uh, in an easy way. And, uh, and, and this is, again, something that politicians couldn't do before. They might have issued, you know, a statement to the press or something like that. People would have read it in the newspapers. But here, he talks directly to the people. You know, can you think of other uh, examples, like even of contemporary politicians who are, you know, trying to or bypassing the media through their, through, through, well, bypassing, let's say, the news industry media through using other media. Oh, yeah. Twitter. Trump and his Twitter, right? Oh, and uh, you yeah, had Instagram. I mean, they all over. Right, right, yeah. Facebook. Obama going on podcasts. Podcasts, and, yeah. Right, yeah. So you know, all of these are kind of ways of talking more directly to constituents for politicians. So I think that you know that's an interesting uh, um, something that you could explore the way that politics um, through the mass media mass electronic media uh, becomes more about, you know, the personality of the individual. It, it is more, you know, Roosevelt is trying to connect sort of more personally. And of course, it, you know, that's back in the day, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue so that politicians have to become kind of accessible. And, uh, and a, lot of, a lot of political work is done through electronic media. Pretty interesting, you know. So again, it extends it extends the individual's personality and, and presence through 
you know, out through, through to a mass audience. Kind of. So I think that's kind of changed. Tony? Yeah, I just, I wanted to kind of piggyback off of uh, the comment earlier about obsolete, uh, things becoming obsolete. And I don't know, it's just that I've been a viewer of television and radio and all of that, and now electronic media. Um, I just see how it, it just continues to evolve, you know. I think that creativity, um, adaptability, <coughs> Whatever the newest technology is, you got to make sure you follow the course, stay the course. I mean, long gone are the days when presidents, uh, long gone are the days when presidents only wait for their television appearances or if they're going to go on tour and visiting different cities and states, if they're going to do some fundraising. They better be on social media these right, days. They, right. they, 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 almost, they almost have to be on social media because then out of sight, out of mind, you know, people lose interest. Um, gotcha. Well, these are, these are interesting thoughts we can take up next class when yeah. we get into yeah. the present and the future kind of, but I just yeah. wanted, I didn't want to lose the opportunity yeah, this is to kind of make this bigger here to discuss the impact that the network system had in developing a national culture, pertinent areas or advertising entertainment, political broadcasting. You may discuss that in the early days of radio or the early television network. So if we were talking about early days of radio, I, I, think you, I think you got some stuff there in the sense, you know, a national, by national culture, we're using the term culture very broadly, but we're talking about, you know, how everybody in the United States is linked up in, new, in a new way, in mm -hmm. a sense, and how popular fads, songs, ideologies, whatever can circulate through that, you know, big connected culture, if you want. It may change the way people think of each other as well. It may enhance a sense that we're all Americans mm -hmm. uh, versus a more kind of regional consciousness. When you are, you know, daily exposed to, uh, you know, entertainment and news from the big centers, the East Coast centers or whatever, you are inviting into your life, you know, news, attitudes, accents, song forms, you know, you name it, that are coming in from these particular centers like New York City into wherever you might live, no matter how rural. Does that, if you're getting news of the war, if you're getting Edward R. Murrow, famous Second World War broadcaster, broadcasting live from a roof in London, he's an American guy, but he's over there for CBS screaming about the bombs falling all around him. You know, uh, Even if you live in some little place which is never going to be touched by the war, you're getting like, you know, VR of the day. You know what I mean? It's like totally immersive. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that, and we, we haven't really talked too much about advertising, but when I, when I see that or I'm thinking about politics, I think another way you could look at this or attack this is what are, what are the benefits and what are the drawbacks? You know, FDR being able to talk directly to the population, to calm them, to try to speak to them as, as equals could appear to be like a real, you know, a really good thing. It's progress. But some people feel that the New Deal was actually anti-constitutional and that the whole thing was sold kind of, you know, so there are positives and negatives. You know, some of those tweets may not be the best, you know, political moves. But what I, and so, you know, you could take it as a kind of a pros and cons. And the same thing about advertising. You know, now that now that the industry discovers, well, we can pay for all of this by selling advertising. Is it a good thing? Well, it's a good thing to inform people about products that they might need, right? But maybe it's a bad thing to give them misleading information sell them stuff which actually isn't at all what they want or need, right? So I think another way you could structure an essay or an argument about this is maybe in terms of, you know, benefits and drawbacks or trade-offs, you know? So there are a couple of ideas there that, um, that we could deal with. So we're out of time for today, but maybe next class we'll just well, we could start off if you have any questions about this kind of approach, and then we'll, we'll pick up on another one.